I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. Today, we have Lisa Wood Shapiro, who's written a new book she's going to tell you about, The Hot Mess Mom. But the way I found her was this great article in Wired on dyslexia, and she's going to tell us all about herself. It's very, very, very interesting. Lisa Wood Shapiro, welcome to Exploring Different Brains. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Why don't you introduce yourself better than I just did to our audience? Um, I'm a writer. I, um, I write for Wired. I write for Vogue. I'm a correspondent for Outside Magazine. I also am an essayist, and I've written for Real Simple. And I um, did write the humorous memoir, Hot Mess Mom. And... Um, I also happen to have dyslexia, and I've kept that a complete secret up until late June when I wrote my piece in Wired called, it started out being called The End of Dyslexia, and then it was changed to How Technology Helped Me Cheat Dyslexia. Well, I really, really enjoyed it, and it 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 goes with part of my theory that Technology itself is rewiring our brains out of necessity, and we'll get into that more later. But tell us about how you use the phrase that you finally got brave enough to come out. And you know what? So many things now are coming out and not being ashamed of it. And tell about a professional writer such as yourself coming out with dyslexia. Um. You know, it was something I was never going to write about. And it, it definitely, I mean, I, it occupied a taboo place in my narrative. I still think, I mean, even the last week when I was making revisions, I was at a house in the Hamptons for a girls weekend. I had friends I've known since high school, freshman year of high school. And one of them took me aside and said, don't write this. You're not going to, you can't ha have this thing get out. And so her reaction was kind of my reaction prior to, I guess, February of 2017 when I started using Grammarly. And I, um, I also have this reaction, whatever I think of something and I think, oh, I don't want anyone to know that. I usually end up pitching it to an editor and writing about it. And so um, I was at a point, and we can get to this a little later, where tech you know, some people say it's an inflection point. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, I had met tech at the place where it was seamless. Uh, Microsoft Word, as I talked about in the piece, um, usually has no suggestion. Um, if I'm on my iPhone, I have, um, I forget what the word is, but it's basically no suggestion. And so um, this little free plugin called Grammarly um, had an extended I don't know how technically you want me to get, but it had an extended edit distance. So, for example, if you spell a word wrong, how many substitutions, deletions, delete, you know, to take a word, letter out, how many of those things will it take to correct the word? And as as we go further and further and expand um, deep, deep learning, machine learning, how things are corrected, we're getting to a longer edit distance or a more efficient edit distance or a faster edit distance. And so I just had this moment, maybe it was in February. I don't remember when I pitched it, but um, no, it was February, 2018, sorry. Anyway, the point of the story is I had this moment with, I think tech was there for me that I could actually write about it. Well, tell us, let's back up a little and tell our audience um, about how dyslexia affected your writing before you had the revelation with technology and Grammarly? Um, I had not even thought about dyslexia as part of my writing process because it, it was just, it's been ingrained. I was, I've always written and I've always been um, what you would call a completely horrendous speller. Um, you know, I did reach out to um, the college boards that produced the SATs and asked if spelling was on the SAT because I had this memory of taking, you know, flunking that part. But actually, it was the um, New Jersey aptitude test or the California achievement test that had that portion on it. So I knew I couldn't spell, but I also 
thought I was really smart all my life. So I just accepted my dyslexia and knew I couldn't spell. So my writing process for the last, I would say, 15 years was me relying on spell check. I've grown up with spell check. I've always been able to use a computer. Um, and so even if, let's just say this, when I misspell a word, it's so off that it might just be underlined and I can't get a suggestion. And then I might put it in a browser bar or I might actually look in a dictionary. I mean, I'll do a bunch of different things for me to get to it. So that's, you know, if you think about that, it probably slowed my writing process down a bit. Um, of a lot, but it also, I got so quick at it that I didn't notice it. And I didn't realize that it could be improved. And I think there's a lot of things that we do every day that we don't realize how much easier tech could make it. And that was definitely what happened to me. Um, and so, okay, so in November of 2017, I actually remember how it started. I had been told about Novo Resume, and if you, I don't know if your audience knows this, but it is an AI backed resume builder. And it had a really, really good spell check on it. And I didn't think about it. And I think somehow doing that made me think, let me plug in this Grammarly thing. And um, let me see if this helps my spelling. And um, it really was almost like falling for a crush. Like I didn't notice what it was doing, you know? I mean, it's really, I mean, it, I, it really happened in this like subtle, seamless way. And there was, you know, it was like an arrow through my heart where I was like, oh, this is easier. And so I wish I could say that, you know, I was researching tech before that moment, but it, it did happen to me in the most organic, I guess, as far as tech goes, the most organic of ways. Well, you know, the, you bring up a couple of interesting things. I remember when I graduated uh, medical school from Boston University, our speaker was one of my heroes, Isaac Asimov, the father of science fiction, some people think. And, um, one of the things he said was, when great discoveries are made, it's not a research in a laboratory saying, Eureka, I finally found it. It's more like somebody going, now that's funny. <laughs> you know? And that sounds like a bit like your journey now. It was exactly, I was going to say, it was, it, was, it was without fanfare. <laughs> it just happened. You fell in love and that was it. Now, you mentioned something about you also feel your directionality on your nautical adventures is affected by the way your brain is wired. Yeah, so if you've ever been, like I, I sail a very tiny sailboat, it's 15 feet long. And all right, so one of the things that um, is very common for dyslexics is they mean to say right, and they will emphatically say left. And they will mean to say left and they will emphatically say right. And sure enough, I will say starboard when I mean port. So that's the boat thing. The other thing is, um, you know, I came to sailing as an adult, but um, there's a really classic knot. Okay. So let's talk about, so it's a sequencing of moving a rope, a line you would call it. And it's a bowling knot. And it's a really classic ancient knot. And the other day we were coming back from a race and I went to, I went to tie the knot and I really had to look at it. And you think about, a, um, you know, a line or a rope and you have to twist it and turn it. So in a way you're making a figure or a character with the rope. And my friend said to me, you know, I'm a little dyslexic and I have trouble with knots and, 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 you know, it's, I've had the same problem with this knot for a long time. And then once I get it, I'm good for the summer. And I was thinking about it and I was like, yes, yes. So it, it's not just spelling. It can come out in other like sequencing of, especially in boating too, because you know it's tiller towards trouble. And I will, I will have to say that. And I think it has to do with so much of the right and left um, and the sequencing of things. And so also music. I mean, I played in marching. I was a marching band geek and I was the worst clarinetist ever to go through that high school. And it was always going to be that way. And I used to like, meet with my band teacher at lunch to get better. And I think, I do believe, the, f the funny thing is I won't kind of give up, but um, which is also part of the dyslexic mind, but um, I do think that there's just different areas. And I, I have a daughter who has none of this and she retained, she can retain Hebrew prayer. She teaches teaching Hebrew for years. She's 17, she's a polygot. And I see how, 
liquid it is. Information comes in, it's retained immediately. And the sequencing, the decoding, the spelling, and I can see how different that mind works than kind of the long-term working memory of my mind. Wow. That's a really long way of saying <laughs> Let's uh, segue because I don't want to forget to talk about it because I believe your new book has just been released. Is that correct? Well, I love the plug. It was released in, um, it was a re-release paperback, Hot Mess Mom, in 2000, December of 2016. And um, it was about my experience the first year of motherhood. And it was a funny memoir and it's had a nice, I really... I mean, that also had a lot of feedback. Um, it was written really from a place of, I wonder if anyone would be interested in this, and I sold it. And um, and it's really about my first year learning how to nurse, um, learning how to, I was someone who was a hot mess mom. Hot mess mom. You could get it on Amazon. And, um, and you know, it's it's much of the kind of stories I write, I write narrative nonfiction. I also write fiction, but I write narrative. I've written narrative nonfiction for a while now. And I've written about so many subjects that in a way are taboo, having a baby, breastfeeding, divorce, online dating. I wrote a piece. This is the second piece I've actually done on my brain. Um, last year for September issue of Vogue for 2017, I wrote TripAdvisor, which is about my experiencing taking ayahuasca, which is DMT. Um, and that, and then, and then this, I've been writing about subjects that make me uncomfortable, but I also can't help but write about them. I also, um, you know, so, so, that was my first time because I will say that before I wrote that book, I had been a TV producer and I created TV shows. And I was, I remember thinking I'm going to have to go into filmmaking and TV, which I was love doing because I don't think I can get a professional job as a professional writer because I can't spell. It wasn't that I didn't think I was smart enough. Um, and even now when I go for jobs, you do very often an industry standard is a writing test. And the first time I took one, I said, is there spelling on this? <laughs> there isn't. It's really to see how you do it. Um, so yeah, so that's the kind of work I've been doing in the last couple of years, which I totally love. And I have written, when I was in film school, I wrote a, sh I wrote a screenplay that ended up in a book that people use academically in film schools, writing the short film. And then I tried to sell a pilot last year that I'm still trying to sell. So I still have my hand in that type of work. And, um, and so I, you're, you're really a Renaissance dyslexic. Right. I, well, <laughs> I love that. I didn't even think he's, um, I created shows for Noggin. I was a co-creator of that. And I, um, you know, I was the producer of fight like a girl, which was a women's documentary for A and E. And I, you know, I had to, I was embedded with women boxers. I mean, I've had, I love, I love documentary the same and reality TV. It wasn't called reality so much. It was fun TV, whatever. I like documentary and I like narrative nonfiction because you get to go into a world and kind of geek out about it for a while, even if it's in my own life. And so I am still drawn to that. Um, you know what's kind of interesting too, just as an aside, when I uh, wrote and produced the Square Root of Two movie starring Darby Stanfield from Scandal, that was kind of the best of both worlds because it was inspired by a true story, but you could use some license, you know? You could create a scene and hyperbolize it, perhaps, and everything. And uh, they say that when, if, you, uh, if you write something as fact, everyone will say, oh, that never happened, she's exaggerating. And if you write it as fiction, they go, oh, I know who she's talking about. <laughs> I know that. I know exactly that restaurant, you know, where it is. Right, well, or, or you write something, people so rarely recognize themselves, but yeah, I mean, and also the, the funniest things that have happened, I feel if I wrote them in fiction, people would say, I don't think that would have happened. <laughs> but, um, and also just getting to the point of different work. So many people, um, one of the people in the piece, um, Gil Gershoni, the Gershoni Agency, sells the dyslexic advantage. I mean, I think that's that's the shift. And then also, um, I mean, look, 
if you, I did reach out to an egg donor place. I was just curious. This wasn't in the piece, but just from my own curiosity, I wrote, um, if I have dyslexia, could I donate, be a donor for donating egg, an egg? And I got an email back within 20 minutes saying, no, that's actually will disqualify you from ever being an egg donor. Now at that particular um, fertility clinic. And so Richard Branson started this dyslexic sperm bank. And so, and also, you know, it's not just in America. I mean, these are these are real things that happen, and these are these are private companies that work to help people have children, which is wonderful. But there there are things you can't do as a dyslexic. And so, um, when Richard Branson, I, it's new, started the sperm bank, um, I did think maybe that's the tipping point. I don't know. I mean, I just thought I do. I love the way your brain works. You just. You're connecting all the dots all over there. How can our audience find out more about you and read more about you? What's um, your website? It's Lisa Wood Shapiro, like one giant word, um, dot com. And you can, if you Google me, I'm also on Twitter. And those are the two public places that I, you know, share my work. Um, you know, a lot of it's sort of Gonzo-esque writing. What tips would you have for people in our audience, whether they're dyslexic or not, on becoming a writer and trying to make a living at it? Uh, you have to have, be egoless. You have to be persistent. Um, anyone that's starting out to write, I would recommend Ryan Holiday's book, um, The Obstacle is the Way. Um, it, it is a fun book to actually it's a great audible if you're riding in the car or something and um the book is really about some of the great quotes of stoicism like seneca a lot of his quotes it sound like they came from someone yesterday i mean but one of the things is um is this for anyone trying to be a writer not just dyslexics right right so you're trying to do something that you're going to get rejected you're going to have to have um a vision and a fortitude to not have an ego about that and to see yourself as just a persistent person doing work and action, action, action. And so I would say anyone that's trying to be a writer to kind of seek out that kind of book where it really talks about um, it's action that will get it done. So, you know, when you first start writing, you might have this great pitch and you send it to the one person you know that happens to be an editor or a writer at a magazine you want to be in, and you might not hear from them and you'll get a no. And that might be three weeks of your life. And I would say you should be pitching constantly and assume you'll get rejected. And if you're giving someone a first look, tell them, but you know, a few days go by, you don't hear, go pitch someone else. If you think it's a good idea, you'll usually land it. Also, um, so anyway, so, but, so I just wanna say a couple of things. So, and then also your loyalty should be to the work. And so you'll get feedback. Um, if you're really starting from scratch, one of the best things you can do is go to um, a writer's workshop. If you're lucky enough, um, especially one in the city or you know one at a local community college, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it, there is something about reading your work aloud. Um, and you have to have that, you really have to put the ego away. Um, also those things you don't wanna write about, those secrets, those are the best, things to kind of harvest. Um, you know, I always, I like to write in a humorous way. I mean, I, just because I think things are funny or, you know, I still, I still have so many mishaps that happen to me just living in the world. Um, but so that, that would, that's the book. I've had a couple people come to me, especially after doing this piece and reach out and say, you know, I want to be a writer. What should I do? And I do recommend right now, I do recommend um, The Obstacle is the Way. And one of the interesting things about it is, um, I don't know if it's Seneca, someone said a quote that, and I'm getting this all wrong and I'm mangly, but this is the idea, um, that he feels sorry for a man that never faced adversity because he never got to see who he really was. And when you're a dyslexic or you have a challenge or maybe you have social anxiety or you have Asperger's and you realize it, or whatever that thing is, if you can overcome it and still get to do what you want, that's that'll give you so much self-confidence. And so it's even beyond self-confidence. It'll just, it'll give you character. And so when I see some people that have never had dyslexia or have had what I would consider 
a very typical way of taking in information, an easy way. Um, high performers on tests, you know, things that come so easy. Um, you know, I don't know if that is the the fertile ground that is going to make you strive harder. And um, I don't know. There's a quote in the book where he talks about all the people that overcome things, and one of the words was dyslexic. But as for anyone that's a writer, um, I have a friend who recently left a job at a bank, and he is going to focus completely on his writing, and the thing I have to say to people is you, you really need to have your loyalty be to the piece and not you. And um, I never seek feedback that's complimentary. I, people will tell you what doesn't work in your writing too. They might not tell you how to, they, they'll try and tell you how to fix it. They're always wrong, but the, what they say doesn't work, they're usually right. That's the other thing I've noticed. Um, also, um, you're doing the work, so it might you might not get much money for an online piece that you write for, but you might get more money, money for a print, but more people will see the online piece. I have no snobbery. Um, recently, well, I, I, I'm a member of the Park Slope Food Co-op, and I missed a shift, and so I asked to write a beauty tips piece for the newspaper. I mean, I've done so much writing. You know, I mean, I just have no, um, I would say persistence. Don't be a snob. Don't have an ego. Those are like, those are my three tips. Good advice. Very good advice. Lisa Wood Shapiro, author of Hot Mess Mom. Thank you for being here at Exploring Different Brains. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains, Inc. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.org.